Okay, well it's 8.02, so why don't we get started? We've got a nice amount of people that have attended the uh, presentation today. And um, so let me just introduce myself. My name is Megan Sanicki. I'm the Associate Director of the Drupal Association. And um, I am here with Mike Potter from Phase 2, who's the Open Atrium Solution Architect. And uh, I just wanted to um, go over a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So if you're listening from your computer and using voice over IP, uh, make sure that you have the right settings for your audio. Use the mic and speaker audio option. Hopefully you saw that in my chat postings. Um, and we're also going to have people remain muted during the call. <clears throat> However, if you want to ask a question, feel free to do so uh, in, the, in the questions portion of your control panel. And we will be answering questions um, as much as we can throughout uh, Mike's presentation. But also uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, and at the end of this um, presentation, you will receive a post-webinar survey. We hope that you will just tell us what you thought of the content today and let the Drupal Association know what other webinar topics you'd like us to cover. Um, and also, it's an opportunity for you to say, yes, I'd love to have more information about Open Atrium or have someone at Phase 2 contact me. We don't share contact information unless you request it. So I just wanted to make sure that was understood because we uh, respect people's privacy. Um, so before I get into the presentation for the day, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Drupal Association. So uh, our role is to foster and support the Drupal community. And uh, we do this in a lot of different ways. Um, first and foremost, our role is to support and improve Drupal.org. So that ranges from uh, the hosting for, the, um, for Drupal.org, or we are actually starting to build out a technical team that is going to be making improvements to the site, making it easier for developers to collaborate, site builders to find their modules, and just support the life cycle of everyone that's coming together to, to build the project. Um, we also run um, Drupal cons, one in North America, one in Europe, and we'll start doing some more in other regions. Um, and so obviously this is just a great event that brings people together in person. Uh, it helps accelerate the project through code sprints. Um, we have a lot of community events to really kind of create that bond between people that are working around the world um, virtually. And uh, it's a great marketing platform to promote the, pro the project as well. So um, that's a really important focus of ours. Um, we have an additional program called Community Grants. So if you have an idea and um, for, for promoting Drupal, whether it's growing uh, our developer base or getting out to different industry sectors to promote Drupal and grow ad adoption by different site owners, we have a grants program that you can apply to. And uh, we've been giving out grants around the world and doing some really great things that range from camps in Indonesia to um, a Spanish language magazine for South America. Um, so be sure to reach out to us. We can tell you more about that program. Also, uh, we want to help grow the community uh, and, and attract more developers who can then um, contribute to the project. So we have global training days to foster that. And we're working with training companies around the world who uh, do a half day or full day of free or near free training, kind of like the Hello Drupal type of curriculum. And uh, they market into their local communities and bring people in and kind of as uh, a way, an on-ramp into our community. So we're really excited to start expanding that program as well. So um, all of these programs um, are funded through different, different aspects. One is, um, of course, our membership program. And we also have um, ad programs with hosting companies on Drupal.org. We have our Drupal cons. And we also have a program I'll tell you about in a minute called the Supporting Partner Program. But let me just give you a, a, a heads up of some things that we are hosting soon. So DrupalCon Prague is coming up at the end of September. So if you are able to make it, we hope you can attend. We still uh, are selling tickets um, and attendance is looking really strong. We've got a lot of really great things from Monday is going to be a community summit day. Um, so if you're a community leader, you want to be there on Monday um, 
to do some knowledge sharing with other community leaders. Uh, we have CXO. So it's uh, if, you're, if you're running a Drupal business, you want to attend and do some knowledge sharing there. And of course, we have tons of our um, sessions in, in the different tracks serving all the different um, types of audiences that attend. And then it, it ends with a huge sprint where we're really going to be pushing hard, moving Drupal 8 forward. So that's going to be really exciting. And then we have our global training days where all the trainers around the world will be doing that half day or full day of training. Um, and that's in November 15th. So reach out or go to this site if you want to participate. And uh, we will be continuing our webinar series. So if you are a Drupal business and you want to be selling more into enterprise accounts, Join us on September 11th and Brad Powers from Whole Foods, um, a large um, grocery retail company in North America, is going to be talking about how he selected Drupal, what that process looked like, and how someone in, uh, selling Drupal and their services can help influence people like him to select Drupal in, in, your, in your solutions. Um, okay, so that is some, uh, some things happening with the Drupal Association. Uh, I did mention that the supporting partner program is one of the ways that we raise funds. Um, it is primarily for Drupal businesses uh, to get special exposure in our community, so they get some great benefits. Um, but all of the funds are going to hire that Drupal.org tech team. And Phase 2 was one of the first companies to sign up for this program. And we're really excited to have their support. And knowing that we can start hiring um, this team to work on Drupal.org is just a it's just a wonderful thing. We're really excited to get there, and we couldn't do it without the support of Phase 2. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, hand this presentation over to Mike Potter, um, who is the Solution Architect at Phase 2. And today he's going to talk about um, Open Atrium 2.0. So Mike, thanks for joining today. Hey, thanks. I'm happy to be here, and welcome, everybody. Um, so yeah, today we're going to uh, talk about Open Atrium 2. We're going to uh, do things a little differently. If you've uh, seen any of the other past webinars uh, that we've done, I decided to do something special for the Drupal Association here. So we're going to make this uh, a little bit more uh, developer heavy, a little bit more site builder heavy. Um, let's go ahead and go to the, the next slide. Uh, and go to, go to the next slide. So just an overview, first of all, I'm not going to really go into a lot about what Open Atrium 2 is. Um, I'll point you to a lot of information, um, but we've, we've really talked about it to death uh, in a lot of different areas. So we're going to try to get past the, uh, the kind of the initial intro. But basically, uh, Open Atrium 2, it's a collaboration framework. Um, we built it from the ground up in Drupal 7, and one of the specific things we focused on this time around uh, compared to Open Atrium 1 was to make it much more, uh, much easier to extend the functionality. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to actually uh, use some existing uh, Drupal modules to uh, to extend Open Atrium. So a plugin in a Atrium is just a module. Uh, it can be really any kind of module. You can build a module using features or apps or just write some custom code. Uh, but however you want to do it, you just create a module, and uh, if you do things a certain way that we'll show you here in a minute, uh, Atrium will recognize that module, and you'll have new functionality. Uh, so I wanted to point to uh, a place where we have our documentation. Uh, the link is there in the slides. Uh, if you go to our uh, products.phase2technology.com site, that's where we have all of our distribution documentation for Open Public and Open Publish and also Open Atrium. And a section of that is called the Community Plugin Toolkit, and that's where we're putting a lot of this technical documentation. And we're updating that uh, kind of as we speak, so it should get better over time as well. So with that, what we're going to do today is we're going to create a very simple to-do task. So Atrium 2 uh, right now does not ship with any kind of issue tracking system like Atrium 1 had case tracker. Uh, Issue tracking is a, a very broad subject, and different people really have different needs. So rather than trying to build the world's best issue tracker, uh, we decide to either leave it to the community or integrate with existing uh, enterprise solutions. But you know, maybe you just want something really, really simple. Like what, what if you just want like a to-do task and a task list? So we're going to show you really how easy that is to do today. Uh, so even though we don't have it built into the product, uh, it's going to be really easy to add it yourself and, and customize it for your own organization. So this is basically the steps of the demo that we're going to go through. We're going to create a task content type. Uh, we're then going to create some views. We're then going to create some panelizer layouts. And we're going to then test it and save it all to features. 
So if you're used to Drupal site building, these kind of steps should be really familiar. Development for Open Atrium is really not that different than general Drupal development. And you can all do all this without, uh, without writing code. So let's jump into the demo. Let's see if we can switch our screen over here. So they need to give me presenter access here. And hopefully I'll get my little pop-up. See, Megan, can you switch over the presenter? There we go, show my screen. Okay, so you should be seeing my uh, screen here. Uh, I'm on the the, the Drupal Association or the, the Drupal.org page for Open Atrium. This is where I mentioned if you want to get more information, uh, just go to the project page. Uh, down here we've got uh, a bunch of webinars and, and various videos linked. Uh, we talk about all the different modules that we include and, and all that. So uh, that's definitely a, the kind of your first uh, resource that you'll want to go to if you want more information. Uh, so now I'm going to pop over to an Atrium site that's here on my local computer. Uh, this is one I've used for past demos, so if you come to my past webinars, you'll kind of recognize some of the content. Um, it's a little basic university site with various departments and schools and, and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, add some tasks. So the first thing we want to do is go create a content type. So we're going to go into our Drupal admin menu over here and go to structure content type. And this is a live demo, so cross our fingers and hope the demo gods are with us today. Uh, we're going to add a content type, and we're going to call this a task. And this is an open Atrium to-do task. And we're just going to save that. And now let's see, what kinds of things do we want for tasks? Typically, tasks are going to have a, a due date and somebody that they're assigned to and maybe a priority. So we're going to go down here to the task we just created and we're going to go to manage fields and we're just going to do the standard stuff we would normally do to add those. So let's go ahead and add a due date and make that a date type and we'll use a pop-up calendar and save that field. And then we're going to add an assign to field for a user. Now let's see, and we're just going to accept the defaults here. We're not doing anything fancy so just accept all the defaults for the date field. And now we're going to have an assign to. And for user fields, for in, if you did D6, you were used to the old user reference. Uh, in D7, everything's an entity, so we're going to make this an entity reference. And since we're only going to be uh, looking at assigning it to people within our kind of project team, I'm going to leave this as a select list because we shouldn't have a, a lot of users. If you had hundreds of users, you might want to make that an autocomplete. But we're just going to keep this as a simple select list. Now, you don't want it to show every single user on your site, so uh, this is our first chance to show you some of the additions Atrium has made to Drupal to kind of help you along. Um, first of all, we're going to say that this points, instead of pointing to a node, that it points to a user. And to select users, you can do several things. You can have just a simple selector, and that's going to show you every single user on the system. And you really only want to assign your tasks to people within your Atrium team or space. So what we're going to do is say, let's give a, a views filter for this field and only show the results of a view. And we come with a predefined view here called the Open Atrium user filter. So when you select that as your entity filter, it's going to automatically filter it so that you only see users within your space, users who are members of your space. And we're also going to tell it to also always render your filters as a select list and save that. Okay, so that gives us basic, let's see, let's go ahead and add a priority field while we're here. And we're going to make this a integer list. And we're just going to set up a couple simple priorities. Um, you know, if you're doing this for, you know, real, you might want to make this a taxonomy or something, but we're just going to do a simple select list here. Uh, so we're just going to do, let's say that zero is low priority. One is medium, two is high, and three is critical. All right, just basic stuff. All right, so those are the typical fields you would add to a task. You know, maybe you want some more. 
Um, but that's that's something that you would do if you were doing Atrium or not. That's just basic fields. Now, how do we make this tie into Atrium? There's two key things we want to do to tie this content type in Atrium. We need to make it aware of our space that we're in, in this case, the physics department. And we need to make it aware of what section we're in within the space. And we'll see sections here in a minute. So we have two fields to add. There's a couple different ways to add those fields. You could go down to add existing field. And when you select the existing fields, you just see a whole bunch of fields. And you know it's kind of confusing as to which one you want to add. You know, In this case, for example, we want to add this group audience field and this uh, section field. So they're both right here. Um, but this list is kind of intimidating. And you might be afraid of selecting the, the wrong field. So there's a little bit of an easier way to do that um, from organic groups. If you go to your admin menu, and we go down to configure, and then go down to organic groups, there's this uh, settings, uh, OG field settings. Uh, this lets you add uh, various types of fields for organic groups to your content types. So up here in bundles, we're going to select the content type we just created. We just created a task. And we want to add this group audience field. And you can see it's going to be called OG Group Ref. Don't change the field name. Just leave it as the default. And let's just say Add Field. And you'll see down here all the, the content types that we've already added fields to. Uh, so now we want to select our task again. And now we're going to add this new field, Open Atrium Section. So Open Atrium ties into this Organic Groups UI and adds this field that you can add to your content type as well. So we just say Add Field. So doing it that way just ensures that you get the right fields added. And if you look at an example, for example, in an event, you'll see an event node has those same fields as well. All right, so now that's basically all we need to do to make that content type uh, accessible to Atrium. So now Atrium is aware of it. So the next thing we're going to do from a site building perspective is we're going to uh, make a view. So let's go to Structure Views. Now, Atrium uses panels. Uh, it's built on Panoply. So when you're creating views, you're going to always be creating content panes. Content panes are special types of views that are panels aware. So in this case, let's call our view name uh, the task view. And we're going to show content of type task. Uh, in the newest first is fine. Uh, but we're not going to create a page. We're just going to say, un unclick that. We're just going to continue and edit, because we don't want a page. We want a content pane. Uh, and if you're not uh, familiar with panels, this might be a little new to you. Um, but basically, you go to Add Display. And just like you would add a block or any other kind of view, there's a view type called Content Pane. So we'll select that. And now let's see. Let's, uh, let's pretty this up a little bit first here. Let's give this a title. Let's call it task list. And now for, we're just going to keep this as an unformatted list. And you'll see why in a minute. What we want to do here is build a very generic view. And then we're going to be able to use this view in lots of different ways. So we're going to keep it generic. We're just going to make it an unformatted list of fields. So it's already added the title field for us. Let's go ahead and add those other fields that we uh, added to the content type. So we had uh, due date. So we're going to add that. We had assigned to, so we're going to add that. And we had priority. And let's add that. So we're going to add all three of these at the same time. And we're just going to select the defaults. So we're just going to check the labels here, make sure that looks OK. So assigned to, that looks fine. And due date, that looks fine. But I don't really care about the time. Um, let's just show the day itself here. And then for priority, let, we'll just take the defaults as well. All right. So we added our basic fields. So any other fields that you wanted to put into your view, you could, you could put here. So then, again, how do we tie this into Atrium? We only want this view to show us the tasks for the, the project space that we're in and for the section that we're in. So we need to add some filters. Now, there's a couple different ways that people have done this in the past. Um, you can get into adding uh, contextual filters and relationships. Um, if you've done organic groups before, you may be familiar with doing uh, relationships with like the OG membership table. It all gets very confusing, honestly. Um, the OG membership stuff is complicated. So again, we tried to simplify your life here by just adding some custom filters. So let's just go ahead and add some filters. And what we want to first filter on is what space you're in. And 
unfortunately our search here doesn't narrow it down too much, but if we scroll down, we'll find content space or content space ID. Either one of those, they're both aliases, and they're aliases of that field we added, the group audience field. Uh, so let's just add that. So we're going to make this a filter, but we want this to be a filter that we can change later. So we're going to expose this filter. Exposing the filter is going to allow it to respond to uh, the space we're in. And instead of calling it group audience, we're going to call it just space. Okay? And we'll leave it all the rest as the defaults. And so now we have a filter for our space, our group audience field. Now let's do the same thing for our section. So let's look for open atrium section. And you'll hear here's that section ref field that we added. So we're going to make this also an exposed filter because again we want it to respond to what section we're in as we browse the site. So we'll expose it and let's just call this simply section. Okay. So we've added some filters. So now let's uh, do a couple other final cleanup things here. First of all, since we're making this for panels, typically you want your content pane to respond to your panel's path. Um, in our case, we're not really doing anything with this, but it's just kind of best practice when you're doing content panes to set that use panel path to yes. Um, we're also going to want this to respond to Ajax. We don't want it to load the whole page when we're just changing a view on the page. So we're going to turn on Ajax to make it a little bit more usable. Okay, now the, the last thing that we're going to do is a little bit different here. We created those exposed filters, but how do we make those exposed filters available now to the, the panels interface. Uh, in Atrium, we've added some functionality to, uh, to panels and Panelizer. If you go to Allow Settings, Allow Settings is typically how you expose what you want people to change from the panels, uh, from the Panelizer interface. Uh, so for example, you might design your view to only show 20 items, but you want to change it, you, know, want, you want to let the site designers change that when they put it on the page to show a different number of items. In our case, we're going to let the, uh, the page designer override the title. Uh, we're going to give this exposed form and allow them to override the fields. And then this is a new one. This says used exposed widgets as pane configuration. This says take all of our exposed filters and make them available to the pane configuration. And you can control down here for each filter whether it's available for just the pane configuration for panels whether it's for both the pane configuration and exposing to the end user, or whether it's only a normal exposed filter to the end user. So uh, this is what you're used to for normal exposed filters. For these, we're going to actually select this middle option of allowing both. And you'll see why in a second. So let's apply that. So now we've got our view. And we're going to save it. Uh, let's see, actually, I want to make one more change after we save it here. Just wait for our network to save this. Um, the last change I want to make is over here to the exposed form. Um, we've actually added another uh, extension with Atrium. So instead of your normal, you know, the normal exposed filters is going to put these filters at the top of the page. Um, from a usability point of view, we kind of like to collapse that by default. So there's a new type of exposed form called the Open Atrium Exposed Form. And it adds an option to your exposed form down here at the bottom called collapsed filter. Uh, and this says by default, we're going to collapse that filter section so it doesn't kind of clutter up the page. And we'll see that in operation here in a minute. So again, just another one of the little helpers that Atrium adds to, uh, to views in this case. So now let's save that. Now we're done with the views. So now we've got a content type. We've got a view of that content type. Um, our next thing is to put that view on a page. So we're going to create a new type of section. So Atrium ships with different section types for things like an event calendar and a discussion post. Let's create a new section type for tasks. So we're going to go to the admin menu and down here under the open Atrium configuration we've created a, a nice little hot link to a panelizer uh, for section templates. You can find this really buried within the panelizer uh, pathing, uh, but we've brought it up here just to make it easier to jump straight to this page. So this is showing us a list of all the different panelizer layouts available for the section page content type. And you'll see the different sections Atrium uh, ships with. Now instead of starting from scratch, let's just clone one of these existing ones. So we're going to clone the new section. Click clone. 
and we're going to make this into our task section. And while we're here, let's change this machine name here to something better than clone. Uh, so let's make this a uh, wait task section, okay? So by cloning this, um, now we want to edit it and just make a couple of changes to it. So we're going to go down here, and you can change all sorts of things uh, in these panelizers. What we want to change is how the content is presented, uh, which is basically changing the page uh, content. So you'll see that by default here, we've got a page content that shows the body of the section, some links, you know, has the visibility over here. But specifically, because we clone the news layout, we've got this recent news widget. So let's get rid of the recent news widget. And we're going to add that view that we just created. So we'll get rid of that. We'll go up here under content. We'll say add content. And we created a content pane, right? So under view panes, are all of the content panes on the system. And there's a couple from organic groups, but here's that task view that we created over here on the right bottom. So we're just going to add that task view. Now we told that task view to expose various things to let us change. So we can change the title. So let's just call this again, um, let's see, project tasks, just so we can change it. You'll notice by default those Space and section filters are filled in with active space and active section. When you click on this, you can change it. You can make it show any space, or you can make it show any section within the space, or you could show specific sections or specific spaces. Uh, but by leaving it as active, that will make this page dynamic, and it will respond to whatever space the, uh, the user is in. Uh, now, we also are going to let the user uh, change that, so we're going to actually expose our form. And we're going to actually keep the defaults here, but we're going to make this into a table. So this is why I meant about keeping this as a very general purpose uh, view. Because I made the view unformatted, now at kind of panels configuration time, I can select whether or not I just want to show unformatted fields or whether I want to show you know, a particular uh, teaser or you know, different display modes. So if you add new display modes, you would see those here. Uh, or in my case, I'm going to make this a table and put the titles along the column header, and I'm going to keep all these fields here. And we'll see how this gets displayed when we add some content to the site. But that is the task view that we want to show on a task section page. So let's save that. So now we've got a panelizer layout. The last step here is to make that layout available to our section type taxonomy. So the way section pages are uh, done is we have a taxonomy for sections called section type. We also have a space type one that works the same way. So we're going to add a new type of section, and we're going to call this our task section again. And here is where we specify for this type of section, we want to use the layout we just created, the panelizer layout, and we want this section to be able to create tasks. And this is what controls controls what appears up here in this plus button. When you click a plus button on a section page, it's going to show you whatever types of content you've added here. And these are called command buttons, and you can look up command buttons and see how those are done. But basically, we just have this new type of section. All right, so we're all done. We've got the content type, we've got the view, we've got the panelizer layout, we've got the section type. Let's go create some content. So we're in our space. Uh, the first thing we want to do in our space is create our task area. So we create a new section page. And we're going to call this section uh, public tasks. So we're going to leave this open. So open to the public. So this is going to be a task list that anybody can see. And down here under section type, we're going to select that new task section that we just created. And we're going to publish this. So now we're in our public task section, so let's create a task. So now you go up here and you'll notice the create task is listed because this section type enables create task. So this is going to be a new task for the public. And it's in our task section. Now we could have rearranged some of these fields. Uh, let's see, let's just make uh, this contain some text here some standard stuff like that. So that's the name of our task. 
Uh, and now, of course, we have to give it a due date and an assign to. So we're going to give it a due date of maybe this Friday. Uh, when we click assign to, you'll see that we only see the users within our physics space. In this case, there's only two users. So let's, let's assign this task to the professor, and we'll give it high priority. Uh, but you'll see it's automatically assigned it to the correct group and the correct section. So uh, when I'm doing a real site design, I often hide these fields because the user shouldn't really need to change them. They're automatically set up for you by Atrium. So when we publish this task, we haven't done anything to make the, uh, the display fancy, so it's just showing us the fields here. So you'd obviously probably do some theming of this page to make your task look, look better. But now if we go back to our section page for public tasks, uh, you'll see our table that we created. So remember we added that view to our section layout, and we told the view to be table, and we gave it these columns. We told it to make the filter exposed and collapsed by default. So this is that open atrium filter setting gives you this little filter button that lets you expand and collapse. Uh, so right now it's automatically filtering this by the section that I'm in. Uh, and this is open to the public. So if I switch over to a anonymous browser window here, and we go to the physics department. So here I just opened an incognito window within Chrome, so we're, we're logged out here. Uh, but you'll see I can go into the public tasks, and I can get an error message. <laughs> Wonderful. Obviously something broke in last night's build. Okay, well normally you would go to public tasks and you would see the task list. So now let's go ahead and um, make a new section. So those are public tasks. Let's go ahead and make a private task area. So we'll go back to our space. We'll add another section. And we're going to call this one private tasks. Let's call it private. And again, we're just going to make it use our task section that we created. So we'll publish this section. Ah, but we need to make this section private, right? So right now it's public. Let's go edit this section. And <clears throat> let's make this private so it's only visible to our little project team. So we have, we have this team created within our space. It only has a couple members in it. We're going to make this task uh, specific to this project. Let's save that. So now when it displays the section, it's going to tell us that this is now private, and the only people who can see this page are the member of this team, and when I click on this team, I'll see that it's only got the uh, professor and student in it. So they're the only ones that can see this particular project. Let's create a task now within this project. So this is a secret task. Only project team can see. And let's give it a due date of Monday. And we're going to assign this one to the student. And we're going to give this one like a critical priority. And publish that. And now when we go to our private task landing page, we'll see that table is only showing us tasks within this private task area. Let's go ahead and create one more, just so we have a little bit more content to work with here. Okay, another private task. And we'll give this one a due date to next Thursday. We're going to assign it to the professor and make it medium priority. So now we've got a couple tasks. So we'll get basic to-do task kind of stuff. And obviously you'd want to add, you know, go ahead and add boxes for, you know, completing tasks and, and all that kind of stuff. So right now when we create this view, we just created the view to sort by due date. Uh, you'd probably want to change it in the future to sort by priority, uh, or maybe even expose some sort options that would show up here so you could change how this was sorted uh, within this filter. But you'll notice that as I go between the private tasks, if I go back to the public task section, it's only showing me tasks that are public. Now what if I wanted to put a list of all tasks up on the space page? So in this case, let's go back to the physics department, the global space page. Uh, you can see in the recent activity river uh, that it's noted, it's kind of logged all these tasks that I've just created here. Uh, but let's create a widget over here on the right-hand side that always shows us all of our tasks. So we're going to customize this space page. And we're going to add a new widget. So we're going to click the plus. 
And we're going to go select that good old view that we created because that view we made is multi-purpose. We're going to add the view. We're going to call this project, call this all tasks. Because what we're going to do is we're going to keep it on active space, but we're going to tell it to show any section within the space. We're not going to show the exposed form. And in this case, I don't want to make it a table. I just want to display the title. So I'm going to uncheck all these other fields. And we're going to save that. So here you see the preview of all tasks. Here's the three tasks. We'll save this as a custom node. So we've just customized our space. We've added a task list. And you can see that it's showing us all three of the tasks, the private ones and the public one, uh, because I'm logged in as admin. Uh, if I go back over here to our uh, logged out user and re Refresh uh, the physics department page. Hopefully this time this will work. And now it's showing us the task widget that we just added. And you'll notice that public users can only see the public task. They do not see the secret tasks that were private for the project. So that's the access control kicking in. In the recent activity river, they only see the public stuff. Uh, they don't see anything about any of those secret, uh, secret tasks. In fact, if I tried to trick it, if I go to the secret task over here as my admin user, and if I click on that task to go to its page, I can copy this URL and go back over to my logged out user and paste in the URL, and you'll see that we get access denied. So we've, dropped, we've got truly private content now uh, created within the physics department space. Uh, so we, all we did was create a normal content type make a view out of it, add the view to our panelizer layout, uh, and start using it. Just added those fields for space and for section. And that made the content type aware of Atrium and turned on all of our access control rules uh, that we have in Atrium to let you have both private, private and public content. So a really simple example. I mean, you know, this is obviously not a full featured uh, to-do uh, task list there, but it gives you the basic idea of uh, of what you can do with just your normal everyday uh, Drupal modules that you're used to, like views and panels. Now, you know, once we've tested this, the last thing you're going to want to do is maybe you want to now use this as a plugin on a different site. Uh, so your last step would be to make this into a module, to an actual plugin module. So what you do for that is you go to the features module under your site structure, and we'll tell it to create a new feature. Once it decides to load. All right, so here we are under the features page. We'll say create feature. And we want to call this our open atrium task feature. So this catches up with this slow network. Live demos are such fun. Come on, site. Anytime. I know I could complain that the feature module is really slow, but since I'm the maintainer of the features module, that would uh, <laughs> be kind of insulting to myself. Okay, here we go. We're in features. So we're going to make this the open atrium task feature. And what we're going to do is add the stuff that we just added. Now, everything that we added pretty much had the word task in it, right? So we're just going to use this nice feature in features of searching for task. Now there's the command button for creating tasks. Command buttons are actually handled automatically by content type, so we don't actually need to export that. But we do want to export that content type we created. So let's click that. Uh, and it's going to auto add a bunch of other stuff down here. It's going to figure out the dependencies. It's going to automatically add those fields. So we have assigned date priority. Um, features now splits out the base definitions from the instances, so it also knows that we have a body field and the section and group ref, but these are shared fields, so we're not getting the base of those fields, we're just getting the instances. Um, we could do permissions. Uh, we do want that panelizer section that we added, so that's our section type. And down at the bottom, we're going to want the view. Here's that task view. So that's everything that we created that we would want to put in the feature. Now, the only thing that's, uh, that's tricky here that you can't put in features directly is the taxonomy term. You'll remember we added the section type for task to the taxonomy. 
Uh, taxonomy terms are not featureizable because they're not uh, they're considered content and not unique. Uh, there is a way around that. There's a module called UUID features, and if you install the UUID features module, that allows you to also export content like nodes, and in particular lets you export uh, taxonomy terms. Uh, so you could do that. You just want to be careful when you're installing that on a new site that uh, there's no conflict with term IDs on the new site. Uh, and that's typically why content is not exported, because things like node IDs and taxonomy IDs could be different on different sites. So when you copy this uh, module or this plugin to your new site, you might have to create that, uh, that taxonomy term manually. You know, what we normally do as developers in this case is we write a little code hook. Uh, so we write an update hook that would create that taxonomy term when the module is installed. Um, but that would be writing code, and I said we wouldn't write any code in this. So if you don't want to write any code, use the UUID features module. Uh, but normally you would write code for that term. But that would be it. We would just we would then download this feature, um, and it is going to download a new module for us called the uh, the OA task module, or the Nutrient task module. Uh, so that's how you create a plugin. Once you have that plugin, you can use it on any of your other HM2 sites. And I'm not going to actually uh, do the download here. Let's cancel this huge window that just opened up on my screen. Uh, wow. What did the Mac just do here? I just got this huge download window that spans multiple screens that just... Okay, let's just try to refresh the page. Or let's just go back to the... Let's actually go back to the slides now since that's the end of the demo. So if we switch back over to the slides, let's see, do I have to... Nope, someone else changed his presenter. Okay, great. Go back to the slides. So somebody should be getting a pop-up to accept screen presenter. Yeah, Stephanie, if you can... Um... Stephanie? Did we lose? I hope we didn't lose Stephanie. Sometimes the pop-up is hidden. Yeah, there we go. Sometimes it hides behind other windows. So to conclude, uh, what we've learned is developing for Open Atrium 2 is just like developing for Drupal. It's all Drupal after all. That's why we that's why we all do this. Uh, so any module that's out there that you want to use, you can you can use within Atrium and, and use it to customize your Atrium. You can build your own plugins uh, using content types, views, panelizer, uh, in the taxonomies. As I showed you, we do provide some helpers to make the integration a little easier. So we do have some custom filters and some exposed filters uh, and some other little tweaks. That's where you really put a lot of the work into Atrium is trying to do those little fine-tuned tweaks to make life a little bit easier uh, so you're not dealing with some of the some of the raw uh, Drupal, uh, Drupal methods there. Uh, so then the last slide, if you want to learn more, um, as I mentioned, the project page on Drupal.org is, is a great place to start the Open Atrium project. Uh, feel free to contribute to the issue queue. We're currently in beta 3. Uh, beta 4 is going to be out probably today. Uh, and we're looking for a public release later this fall. So we're still doing a lot of development, a lot of bug fixes, and uh, just a lot of tweaks and improvements. So if you find little bugs, feel free to contribute them to the issue queue. Um, if you want to get involved in development and fix some of those bugs, that would be also uh, awesome. Uh, we've got an email list, openatrium at phase2technology.com. There's an IRC chat for people to kind of help each other at uh, hash openatrium. And you can follow us on Twitter at, at openatrium. Uh, so that's it. Now we'll, uh, we'll take some questions here. So go over to the question, for, uh, question area, and I'll try to uh, read through some of these here. Great. And... and uh, for those that have raised their hand using the control panel, if you could just put your question in the questions portion of the control panel, then Mike can just answer the question that way. Yep. So let's see. The first question comes from Juan, and he asks about OA2 responsive technologies. So yeah, making OA2 mobile accessible is definitely one of our big goals in OA2. Um, you'll, the, the theme that we're using is actually uh, based on Bootstrap, and Bootstrap is a CSS framework that exists uh, beyond just Drupal uh, out there that's for doing responsive theming. Uh, we're spe specifically using the Radix theme that was made for Panoply uh, using Bootstrap, and we've extended that quite a bit. 
Um, it doesn't uh, fully work right now. That's something we're working on in the beta is making things like the toolbar uh, across the top properly collapse. Um, we're going to be actually doing, I think, some fun uh, cutting edge mobile stuff with this theme here soon. So definitely keep an eye out for that. But the idea is that, yeah, people use their mobile device these days and, and using Atrium with mobile was a, a big design requirement. Um, then, and then on, I'm sorry, uh, Juan asks another great question, which is with the arrival of Drupal 8, uh, the migration plan will be easy. Well, uh, I don't know that I would put uh, easy there. It's going to be like any other large Drupal upgrade. Anytime you go from one major version to another, uh, whether it's trying to go from Atrium 1 to Atrium 2 and D6 to D7, or from D7 to D, to D8, uh, there's always going to be issues there, uh, mostly with contrib modules. Uh, Atrium is a fairly uh, large distribution. Uh, we have over 140 some odd modules in Atrium. So obviously those modules have to be updated for D8. So things like organic groups and panelizer and you know, obviously a lot of views is in core now. Um, but a lot of the modules that are using Atrium, we're going to need to wait till they're in uh, Drupal 8 before you could migrate there. Uh, with that said, we have architected Atrium 2 with 8 in mind, with Drupal 8 in mind. So uh, in terms of how it's built uh, from the ground up, um, we're, uh, we definitely designed it so that we don't have to do another year-long development task uh, for Drupal 8 <clears throat> once we decide the modules are stable enough. But you're probably looking at a couple of years before the modules are stable enough uh, to really see Atrium 2 on Drupal 8. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Dirk asks how to create activity feed that aggregates specific sections of separate spaces. Uh, so Dirk, Atrium is not designed to really aggregate um, specific sections across specific spaces. You could certainly write a view, a custom view that did that, and you would just, you know, go to that exposed filter that we created, and in the view, you could select instead of making it exposed, you could say make this one of and then select the spaces and sections you want. Um, but in general, uh, Atrium is designed to be kind of a little, a little microsite thing where the spaces are independent of each other. So the idea of aggregating across different spaces and then kind of cherry picking sections within that um, is not really an out of the box uh, use case for Atrium. So it's certainly doable with Drupal, but uh, you'll probably have to do a little bit of uh, extra work on that. Uh, Grant asks, can you talk about the architectural changes in OA2 that replaced the functionality provided previously by spaces, Perl, and context modules? Yeah, great question. Switching from spaces and context over to panels. Um, so obviously the, the part of spaces and context that had anything to do with layout is all taken care of now through panels and panelizer and the in-place editor and all of that kind of, uh, those kind of modules. So the only thing that's really left there are the kind of some of the space specific uh, configuration stuff. We created a module called OG Variables, which lets you create a plugin module that exposes a variable that you want to have um, customized per space. So when you go into your space configuration, you can go into the variables tab and set the name of a variable. So for example, like let's say you wanted the site name to be different uh, in different spaces. I could go into the physics space and I could say, I want my site name to be physics department. Um, and then instead of your global site name, it would take on that value whenever you're in that space. So again, that was something that spaces did. The Perl stuff specifically about doing custom domains is something we're still working on. Um, it's probably not going to use Perl. We're probably just going to directly use some of the Drupal 7 hooks for uh, altering the, uh, the URL mapping. Uh, but the idea is that, yes, we want to be able to let you provide a domain name per space so that, for example, the physics space would be, you know, physics.university.edu instead of, you know, slash group slash physics or whatever it is now. Uh, so it's almost there. Uh, most of it's there. It's just not the domain stuff yet. Uh, Derek asks, is there an upgrade path from OA1? Uh, that's also a great frequently asked question. Uh, I'm sorry to say that with our limited resources, we did not generally solve the problem of how you upgrade Drupal 6 to Drupal 7. Um, and sorry, that's a little bit of a, of a joke answer. But yeah, we, we know that uh, going for major versions of Drupal is, is difficult. It really depends on your specific site and what you've done specifically to customize it. If you've got just plain OA1 out of the box, absolutely no customizations, then yeah, you're not going to have too hard of a time. Uh, we're going to have migrate scripts to migrate your users and your spaces. Uh, it's going to migrate the blogs over to our discussions. It will migrate the events. It will migrate the 
uh, the old notebook functionality into our new document pages. What it, mo what it will not migrate is the case tracker stuff because there is no case tracker module in OpenHRM2, uh, which is mainly because there's no case tracker module really stable for D7 at all yet. Um, there is a contributed module uh, by David Snopek out on the project page for Atrium called Work Tracker, uh, which is kind of his attempt to create a little issue tracker for Atrium. Um, so he might do some migration for that, but that's pretty much up to up to the plugin maintainers to do those migrations. Obviously, if you've done any kind of customization to your spaces, um, that's done completely differently. You know, we can't migrate the uh, the spaces and context stuff over into panels. So you'll have to, you know, redo all your layouts and those kinds of things. But your, your data should come across uh, with the migrate module. Um, let's see. Uh, Nathan asks, how about something like the relationship module to tie content together? I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there. Uh, so you might follow up that with a more specific use case. Uh, Keith asks, when adding content from the admin toolbar very top, where does the toolbar get the content types? So. Um, from the admin bar, uh, let's see if I can, uh, let's see, the stupid pop-up is still on my screen, so I can't, uh, we're not going to go back and share the screen here. So the admin button that's in the upper left that you saw me using, that is just the Drupal's admin menu, because I was logged in as the admin user, right? So that, when you say add content, is just going to take you to the normal Drupal add content page, and it's going to show you, you know, all your content types. That plus button that I was clicking, which is up in the toolbar more on the right-hand side, that plus button is kind of what we call the contextually aware add content button. And it knows what kind of content your sections and your spaces accept. And so it knows, like, oh, I'm in the event calendar section, therefore I should allow you to create events. Uh, just like it was allowing us to create tasks when we were in a task section. And that's controlled by those taxonomy terms for your section and space type. Uh, so you can go edit those terms and, and check more boxes and add more options to that. Uh, Ricardo asks, is there a guide like you showed us today available somewhere? Uh, so yeah, I mentioned it at the beginning. The uh, So if you go to the slides, which I'm sure will be available, there's that products.phase2. Uh, technology.com site where we have all of our uh, technical documentation um, and it uh, talks about uh, a lot of this. Uh, Nathan asks, so what is the process of upgrading within the relay cycle, i.e. beta 3 to beta 4? So yeah, one of the things about beta that we're uh, guaranteeing is that there is upgrade between beta. Uh, if you're on alpha, we didn't provide any, any real uh, guidance for alphas, but now that we are in beta status, if you're on a beta release, uh, when a new beta comes out, you'll just download the new beta and overwrite your existing files with it and uh, run the Drupal update.php script, and you should be good to go. Um, if update.php doesn't work, there's some, uh, a couple of the modules are starting to use some um, specific version checks where they're looking for like certain versions of views and things, and I've noticed that that can sometimes block the update.php from working, uh, and so in that case, you might have to resort to using Drush um, if you haven't used Drush before, definitely go learn Drush. Um, but Drush has a, a updb command which runs that update script and isn't blocked by those uh, version errors. I'm hoping I'm hoping that things will get fixed with the update script so that that's not a, a problem in the future. But I've noticed it when doing it myself. And so same thing when the final release comes out, you'll just download that release and overwrite all your existing uh, files with it. Uh, Ryan asks, are there any plans to add uh, a follow feature for users? So yeah, Ryan, right now you can actually do that. Um, the, the widgets that are in Atrium 1, or in, that are in Atrium 2 right now, lets you customize your user dashboard. So if I wanted to follow you, for example, um, I could customize my dashboard and I could add a recent activity view widget and I could set the user to be, you know, Ryan, and that would show me all of your posts. And so in a sense, that's following users. Um, in terms of making that a little bit easier into kind of a one-click button, um, it's on the roadmap, I think, for the future, but not necessarily something that we're doing for the first release. Um, Derek says, release date of 2.0 uh, official stable. I mentioned that it's going to be this fall, uh, so Q4. Uh, that's as specific as we're going to get at this point. Uh, I want to make sure it's ready before we release it. Uh, Ryan asks, are there plans to add more fields to user profile around skills and ability like LinkedIn? So the, the user profile area is another area we're trying to improve for release. Um, right now there isn't even really a profile tab. There's the user dashboard and there's the user's activity stream. 
um, but there's no fields like you mentioned for, for bio or skills or abilities. Um, we're probably going to provide a tab for that, but then allow you to basically customize that yourself because different, different sites are going to need different, uh, different field requirements there. But it should just be a matter of adding fields to your user uh, entity, just like you do normally in Drupal, uh, and have them show up there. So we'll probably have support for the basic you know, description or bio. Uh, we already have support for the user's uh, picture, uh, avatar picture. Um, but that's, you know, we may have an organization field, but we're probably not going to get too specific uh, uh, on that. Uh, Kelly asked, will this uh, recording be posted online? And I'm sure I can answer that for Megan and say absolutely yes. Uh, so you'll, you'll get a link for that uh, once it's up. David asks, uh, which is the module in D7 that displays the node publishing settings and so on the right sidebar, like D8? Um, not quite sure exactly what you're talking about there, David. Um, the, I, I, I have not done a whole lot of D8 stuff yet, so I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Uh, so sorry, I can't help you with that. That's not really an OA2 question. If there's a module that displays that, it would certainly work fine with OA if it supports uh, panels. Uh, and then Ryan says, hi, if I was used to use this for education, could one use a space for course syllabus and a section for each of this week's assignments? Um, yeah, so typically, uh, I mean, you, would, you could definitely do that. What I would actually do is, so we also support subspaces. So spaces can have a full hierarchy. You can have spaces with subspaces. And then at the very bottom, the section is used to create little private areas. So if your weekly assignments needed some kind of privacy, where some weeks you have assignments for one team and some weeks you have assignments for you know, a different team and you want to keep those separate, then sections would be good for that. And your syllabus, your course syllabus, would probably be a subspace within a space for, you know, like in education, we were talking like the physics department or the chemistry department. You know, those would be spaces. And then within the physics or chemistry department, you would have a subspace for courses. Um, you, then you might have subspaces for each course, you know, chemistry 101 or something. And then within that subspace, you would then have sections for the different week's assignments and a little discussion board where your students could, could you know, exchange homework questions and stuff like that. So yeah, that's definitely a good use case. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see, I think that is all the questions. Okay. That was certainly a lot of questions. This is clearly a really oh. hot topic. <laughs> and we have, we have one more, and I sure. think we have just time. The Go last question goes to Dirk. Dirk says, does Solar Search add increased functionality to OA2 Search? Uh, so great question. OA2 supports solar out of the box, so you can either do Drupal search or solar search. We fully support the solar search facets, so you can have search facets. Uh, so yeah, all that all that is available. Okay. Well, great. Well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this presentation today and to answer all these questions. You know, I think. Um, Obviously, open atrium is used around the world in a lot of different applications, you know, a lot of different solutions. And, um, you know, as an end user, I know I've been given different kinds of productivity tools to use, but sometimes it just doesn't, it just wasn't tailored to my organization and the roles and the workflow. And, you know, it's just really hard to adopt a tool like that. So I think open atrium is really powerful because a developer can customize it and really show the client that they understand the client and tailor it to their needs. And, um, and hey, it's built in Drupal, so that's even better. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. We want to make it really easy to uh, to use this on because everyone's got different needs. You know, it's there's not going to be an out of the box one solution for everybody, and that's kind of the way Open Atrium One was presented, and we just realized that that just wasn't uh, solving people's needs. So. Yeah, this is great. Really exciting. Well, then let me go ahead and um, just kind of close it out here. For anyone that still has questions, feel free to either type them in or you can shoot uh, me or Mike an email um, and uh, we'll make sure they get answered either directly or we could do a blog post back to the community off the Drupal Association news. And um, But I just wanted to remind everyone, I'm sure most of you are developers, but if you're also a freelancer or you're part of the sales team at your company, you, I, I encourage you to attend the September 11 webinar on how to sell to enterprises and 
hear how Brad Powers, the IT director at Whole Foods, made his decision and how you could also help someone like him choose Drupal and your company. Um, and then just, uh, we also have DrupalCon Prague coming up the end of September, so hopefully you can uh, join that. Phase two is gonna be there as well, so you can meet them face to face, and uh, Global Training Days will be in November. And then lastly, if you like today's presentation and the things that the Drupal Association um, is doing for the community, we hope that you'll help fund us. Uh, you could be an individual member, which is roughly $30 US, $22, or 22 euro. Um, organization membership uh, is great for companies to give back, and it's, it's roughly $200 US and 73 euro. Um, and then, of course, if you have a company that is in a position to really give back, they could become a supporting partner like Phase 2. And uh, you could just email me if you're interested in that. So uh, that is our webinar for today. I just want to thank everyone for attending. And we are recording this. And you will um, get an email from us uh, with that recording. So um, thank you. And I'm just going to close this out. Anything else from you, Mike? Nope, I'm good. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks okay. Thanks for doing this, too. And yeah, my pleasure. Okay, thanks again. Bye-bye.